This is a brief introduction to adjoint-based optimization, and I'll use the example of a wing. And on a wing like this, one has lift and drag. And there are many things you can change on the wing, but for the moment, let's imagine that you can change the camber, which is how curved the center line is through the wing, and the angle of attack, which could be shallow or it could be steep. And imagine that we want to optimize, that is to say, maximize lift divided by drag uh, by changing the camber and the angle of attack. So if I draw these on two axes on the left, and on the horizontal axis I'll put angle of attack, and on the vertical axis I'll put camber, I want to find the place on this plot where lift over drag is maximized. And that corresponds to a shape with some angle of attack and some camber, so maybe something like this. And then I could find another spot, say here, and discover that the lift upon drag is 3. And I might try another spot here and discover that the lift upon drag is also 3. And then another spot, it might be here, 2.9. Uh, here it might be 2.5. And I could continue this process until eventually I find the maximum lift upon drag, wherever it may be, but let's say somewhere around here at let's say 4.1. And this trial and error way of doing optimization is very costly and inefficient. Let's consider a more intelligent way of doing this. I'll go back to the original point. And now imagine we had the original point. We then do another point next door at a slightly higher angle of attack and another point next door at a slightly higher camber. And with those two pieces of information, we work out the gradient of that point, so how to increase lift upon drag and then we march in that direction, try a new point, try a point next door uh, and a point above, find the new gradient, and then keep on marching, doing the same process until we find some sort of maximum. And that's called gradient-based optimization. And the way we found the gradient was by finite difference. And that simply means that we went to the original point and then moved a finite difference one way a finite difference the other way, and estimated the gradient from those two pieces of information. That process is reasonably efficient if there are only two things we can change, in this case camber and angle of attack. But what happens if there are a hundred things we can change, or a thousand things we can change from one wing to the next? Well, the answer is that every single gradient calculation requires a thousand calculations, and that's very expensive. And in adjoint-based optimization, we get rid of that finite difference step, which is expensive, and replace it with a gradient that is calculated using the adjoint equations, and those are cheap. So that means we can do the same gradient-based optimization as before, but now, at every step, we require just two calculations. The first is the original calculation to work out the lift upon drag, and the second is the adjoint calculation to work out the direction of this arrow. And now I'll say a little bit more about this, the adjoint gradient calculation. So let's go back to our airfoil shape and imagine it defined by, say, 100 points. There are only 40 shown here, but I'm sure you get the idea. In a computational fluid dynamics package, we would mesh around those points, and then we would calculate the flow variables on that mesh. So in an incompressible flow, the flow variables are u, v, and w. That's the velocity components in three directions, uh, and the pressure. And in this example, this is shown at a relatively small Reynolds number of around 400. And once we have the flow variables, then we can work out the forces in the horizontal and the vertical directions around the airfoil. So in the horizontal dire direction, that is the drag, and in the vertical direction, that is the lift. And on this page, I've shown the same concept, but where each black dot represents a piece of information. Think of it as a degree of freedom. So let's say we had 100 of these points here. Uh, each of them has an X position and a Y position in 2D, so we have 200 parameters at the beginning of the calculation. So the next thing to do is to create the mesh around the airfoil and then solve for the flow variables on that mesh. And now we might have 10 million degrees of freedom, each of those being U, V, W, and P on every grid point of the mesh. And whether that's 100,000, uh, a million, 10 million, or a billion, doesn't really change the main point here. The point is that there are many more flow variables than there are parameters. And then after we've calculated all those flow variables, we dissolve them down into two things that we care about, the lift and the drag. 
So we started with 200 things we could change, and we ended up with two things that we're interested in, and on the way we calculated 10 million things. So that's fine, that's the direct solution. If I go back to the first slide, that's finding this point just here. What I'll do next is change the position of one of the points. So that's a bit like moving in that direction on this chart, but we're not just changing the angle of attack, we're changing the position of one of the points along the aerofoil. So I've shown that on the diagram just here. And we're doing this to get the finite difference gradient. So we've changed one of the original 200 parameters, and we're going to see the influence that that has on the lift and the drag. So we take the new set of parameters, we recalculate the flow variables, and then we recalculate the lift and the drag, which both will have changed a bit. And that's the first part of the first finite difference calculation. Next, we move on to the next parameter. So that one there just changed. We then recalculate the flow variables, and then recalculate the lift and the drag. And we move on to the next point here, recalculate the flow variables, and recalculate the lift and the drag. And we continue to do this for all of these parameters. Now, at the end of that process, which requires 200 calculations, we now have this arrow here, this direction, but in the 200-dimensional space in which we're doing the optimization. So that, you can see, is expensive, and it's expensive because we have a lot of parameters. And perhaps another way of thinking about this is that during this process of calculating 200 different calculations just to form that finite difference gradient, we're throwing away a lot of information. I mean, we're only interested in two things, lift and drag, and yet along the way we're working out the whole flow solution for every single one of those changes, and then throwing away the information that we get for that. And the alternative solution is essentially to do the same calculation, but in reverse. Let's start with the lift. The first thing is to see how the lift is affected by every single flow variable. That feels as if it should be expensive, but it's not. It requires roughly the same calculation as that we did for the original solution. So instead of calculating u, v, w, and p at every point, we're calculating the partial derivative d lift by du, d lift by dv, d lift by dw, and d lift by dp at each point. And then we go back and see how those flow variables are affected by every parameter. And that again is a relatively cheap calculation. It's about the same price as we paid for the original forward calculation. And so now you have in one calculation how the lift is affected by every single parameter. And then all you have to do is do the same for the drag. And now you have all your gradient information with just two calculations instead of with 200 calculations. And obviously this process gets more and more beneficial the more parameters you have. And in many optimization problems, there are many, many more things you can change than things you care about. And so adjoint-based gradients are almost always cheaper to produce than finite difference-based gradients. So now I'll go back to that original problem where we have angle of attack on the horizontal axis and camber on the vertical axis. And here in contours, I've done a brute force calculation and I've actually calculated the lift upon drag on a whole grid of values and then plotted in contours the lift divided by drag as a function of angle of attack and camber. So you can see that the maximum lift upon drag is somewhere around here. And now I'm going to show a real example of this. So we start off at the bottom left point, zero angle of attack, zero camber, that's this aerofoil at the top right. And we work out the gradient at that point, and it says that to increase the lift over drag as much as possible, we need to move in the direction of the red arrow. Now there's an important question of how far to move in the direction of that arrow, but I won't touch on that here. Let's say that gets us to th this point here, and this has a higher angle of attack and a higher camber. That's actually this airfoil here, the second one down. And then we perform the calculation again. So we have the solution here, we get the adjoint solution, and it tells us to move in this direction here. And again, we move a certain distance, in that case to this point here, which is the next airfoil. And then the final step is to move in this direction here, which we get with the adjoints again, and it's to the optimum value here in just four calculations. So this is really a very fast way of finding that optimum. We start from a point, any point, for example this one, 
We work out the direct solution and the adjoint solution, which gives us the gradient. We then move in that direction to another point. We recalculate the direct solution and the adjoint solution, which says move in that direction. We get to this point, we recalculate, etc. And the key point is that at every gradient evaluation, we've just done two calculations. And that works whether we're using, as we are here, two things we can change, or 200 things that we can change. And that's a brief summary of adjoint-based optimization.